we actually have, there we go, the webinar is being recorded. We have Analia Lang with us today. Um, and we're just giving everyone a little bit of time to go joining we're up to two, 300 attendees, which is fantastic. I always love this group of attendees. You guys are with us every month or every couple of times a month. This is actually our last webinar uh, for 2022, but we hope to get started early in 2023. Hello, everyone. Feel free to say hello in the chat. Um, and I'm really excited, really, really excited. Uh, today, we actually have Analia Lang with us. Um, she's going to be talking about a really um, among the most important topics we can discuss as interpreters. I think one of the things, there's a core skill set an interpreter brings to their profession. But getting beyond that to what really sets a professional community interpreter apart is the ability to handle some of the difficult situations we encounter. Um, and it's inevitable. I think we have all been in situations to where it's literally uh, a doctor and a patient visit will say, get your affairs in order. Um, and they will deliver some very, very difficult test results. Uh, they'll talk about a lot of things that maybe even the medical professional themselves wasn't prepared to actually deliver. Um, and so I'm going to get into the topic here in just a little bit, give you a breakdown, but it's something that's very, very important to all of us just to be conscious of that there's a way you interpret and then there's a way you interpret difficult news. Um, so the topic today, it's actually, it's, it's about delivering bad news. So it's definitely, as we mentioned in email, one of the hardest tasks in the medical field. We have doctors, we have medical students, we have nurses, we have clinicians. They're often faced with this challenge, but so are we as the interpreter. So the whole purpose behind this webinar is actually to help equip interpreters with the essential tools to help them be prepared to anticipate these challenging scenarios. We're gonna cover some of the most common questions that are asked by physicians to patients when delivering bad news, uh, and that will help allow the interpreter to be better prepared emotionally and linguistically to handle those situations. And Analia, um, when, I, when I hear of Marjorie talking about trainers, Marjorie is first and foremost, my predecessor at CCC, an interpreter trainer. She was first an interpreter. Let's say she's first and foremost an interpreter, but then there's interpreter trainers and she trained for a long time. Uh, I've never heard her talk so effusively, praiseworthily <laughs> as she did about Analia. She had a huge, huge amount of love and respect and admiration for the way Analia teaches interpreting for the trainer she is. Uh, and Analia, you can tell from the moment you talk to her that she's through and through a community interpreter and she's through and through a trainer of community interpreters. This is what she does day in and day out. And this is the topic she brings to us as one of the most important ones we all need to be familiar with as, as interpreters. So just to get into Analia's background just a little bit, Analia is definitely the expert on Analia, but she is a CHI Spanish certified interpreter. She went to Indiana University where she got her BA. She's been a medical interpreter since 2005. She has trained healthcare interpreters for more than 15 years. At the present time, she actually serves at UpHealth. She's at UpHealth and Marty as a training specialist and a subject matter expert in language access, quality, and training for remote interpreters. She's done a ton of webinars. She's done a ton of workshops. She's done a ton of training curriculum for interpreters. Uh, she's been a presenter at a number of conferences. She is actually a contributing author on the Remote Interpreter Textbook, which we'll be publishing in January, January, early, early of 2023. 
and she's actually on the standards and training committee for NCIHC. Um, so super excited, Analia, you can take yourself off mute if you like. Um, Thank so you, thanks for joining us. Thanks for being with us. I will be in the background, but feel free and uh, enjoy the presentation, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, John, for your kind words. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. I hope everybody can see my screen. Just moving a few things out of the way here. All righty. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, today. I am very excited about the topic. I will be talking about interpreting bad news what interpreters might learn from medical training and research. And ladies and gentlemen, regardless of the modality of interpretation we employ, whether we are on-site interpreters, also known as face-to-face, -face, we are VRI, video remote interpreters, or OPI over the phone, delivering bad news will never be easy. And most likely, we will encounter it in our profession. Physicians, medical students, and most and other healthcare professionals would agree that delivering bad news is one of the hardest tasks, hardest task of the profession. Briefly, I, I know John uh, mentioned a little bit about me. I have been an interpreter since 2005. Uh, I worked in a labor and delivery hospital for over 12 years, and also I acted as a bereavement counselor when it was needed. Some of my examples are from my years at the hospital. At the present time, uh, besides being a trainer uh, of interpreters, I'm a VRI and OPI interpreter. Okay, let's talk about our objectives. Okay, the first question is for our objectives, what is needed, <laughs> okay? And this is an open-ended question because several factors are needed in this topic. And I will briefly touch on just one that is not part of the topic itself, but you will see how much is actually part of the presentation. I will talk about bad news, a definition, what kind of challenges interpreters face when delivering bad news? What kind of implications of modalities of interpretation we face? Epic model, what, what is it? How to implement it? This spikes protocol. What is it, how to implement it, and how is that relative to us as interpreters? How culture plays or may have an impact when interpreting bad news? Applicability, ladies and gentlemen, of the National Code of Ethics and the Standards of Practice when we're interpreting bad news. And lastly, but not least, debrief and self-care for interpreters. I want to remind us that as healthcare interpreters, we not only interpret for the patient and the provider, but also for the patient's friends, family, and even caregivers. So we go back, what is needed, right? That was the first question. So as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot that could be addressed on this topic, and I am only going to focus on the topic itself, but I will remiss not to mention empathy. Empathy open the eyes of your heart to see beyond the words and the behavior of the person on the outside, to see the feelings and intents of the person on the inside. Throughout this presentation, you will see that empathy is at the core of delivering bad news, of interpreting that the delivery. It is a human element that goes hand in hand with our profession.
bad news. What is it? The definition we're using today, bad news is any news that drastically and negatively alters the patient's view of his or her future. As you see, bad news is subjective because what may seem the end of the world to one individual, to somebody else may not look that way. So again, bad news is subjective to each individual person. In the previous slide, we talk about the definition of bad news. And here we see some of the implications as a result of hearing bad news. Bad news results in a cognitive, behavioral, or emotional deficit in the person receiving the news that persists for some time after the news is received. Though the definition and implication may vary, according to individual perception. The reality for us as interpreters is that we are going to be dealing with highly emotionally charged situations. Therefore, it is of paramount importance that we are prepared in how to deal with each encounter in order to adjust our delivery and be the professional interpreters that we are. So what are some of the challenges we may face when interpreting or delivering bad news? The following list is not exhaustive. It is based on a qualitative study from pro professional interpreters and their experiences. So let's, let's look at them. Challenges in delivering bad news. Do I provide? a strict interpretation or act as an advocate or cultural broker. And we may face this dilemma. By default, this could cause anxiety, stress, tension, you name it, I understand it. Do I ignore how I feel? or consider my own personal emotional difficulty when interpreting bad news. Ladies and gentlemen, this presents a dilemma, right? Do I push through this interpreted encounter because this is my profession, my job, and clinicians also experience these same challenges as I do? Do I ignore how I feel? There is a fine line that only the interpreter, interpreter themselves may decide. Our profession, though, supports us that if we feel traumatized by what we are interpreting, we may withdraw from the interpreted encounter. Please remember, if you choose to do so, to always talk to the person you report to, okay, before doing that. More challenges, I know. Feeling abandoned by clinicians, right? Uh, here's one that some of us may have experienced. Uh, sometimes physicians, they forget, and probably not intentionally, that we are also part of the treating team. Therefore, we are recipients of what is being communicated in the session. Thus, it may affect us emotionally. Abuse by clinicians, hopefully these are just rare instances, but it may happen. And you may wonder how so, what do you mean Analia by abused? Maybe the provider is so wrapped up on the crisis itself that inadvertently they vent at us. Balance, do I interpret for the patient or the family, right? This is a dilemma as well. What do we do? 
Ladies and gentlemen, remember healthcare interpreters are hired to interpret not just for the patient, but for their family and friends as well. Uh, working at the hospital, I would work uh, two nights a week from 7 p.m. to 7.30 the next morning, the grave shift. And I vividly recall, re, you know, remember to this day so graphically, it was 1 a.m. in the morning and a 40, a, the patient was 40 weeks pregnant, basically term, and she was ex experiencing contractions. So she came to the hospital really excited because her due date was the next day. And so the nurse and I were in triage and the nurse was getting the straps or the monitors, right? So when a patient comes to triage that she's pregnant, two monitors are put on her belly, on her abdomen. One is to monitor the baby's heartbeat, the other one to monitor the patient's contraction. The first one that they always place first is the to monitor the baby's heartbeat. Well, I noticed that the nurse got very nervous because she just kept adjusting it and adjusting it. Okay, she didn't say much to the patient. Obviously, I interpreted everything at all times. I was transparent. So we left the room and we came back with a little device called the Doppler. And I asked her before we, we went in, I asked the nurse, why are we using that device? I've never seen it used. And she says, oh, well, this really helps us to find out the baby's heartbeat faster and easier. So we went back inside and there, you know, uh, she's using the device and I could see in her face, in the nurse's face, the panic, okay, the concern. Okay, so, but she didn't say anything to the patient. Again, just say, okay, we'll be back. I'm going to get the residence. So we went outside and at this time, uh, this was a, this is a teaching hospital. So we came back with the resident in charge uh, of the patients. And the resident, again, is doing the same thing. He's monitoring everything. And I could see in his face that they couldn't find the heartbeat. Well, at this point, we step out. Nothing is said to the patient yet. Just imagine, she came to deliver her baby. Four, it was her third uh, pregnancy, third child. And she, her due date was the next day, and she's having contractions. Why would have ever her imagined that her baby was dead? So we get the attendant physician, the attending physician. That's the one in charge of all the residents and the nurses and delivery and everything that is happening. And he comes inside and does everything again to, to make sure that there was a heartbeat that the nurse and the resident had not, not missed it. And they were right. There was not a heartbeat. At this moment, the provider, the attending physician, tells a mom and dad that there was no heartbeat, that the baby was dead. You would imagine, as I was delivering this bad news, mom and dad start crying and holding each other. And at that moment, the, the doctor said, we're going to give you some time just to, to process this information, take some time to talk to each other and we, we will be back. So we left the room and outside we were talking about what they needed to discuss a bit about when we get back in the room. And when we got back, in, and I remember I'm interpreting all of this, right? So the doctor told the, the mom and the dad that they needed to check her cervix to, to see if she had dilated. Dilated means the op, that the cervix is opening, right? And for a pregnant person to start pushing, they need to get to 10 centimeters of dilation. So he said, if you have dilated more than we would like to, um, you may have to deliver this baby right now, tonight, right away. Or if you're not as dilated, you could go home, just process everything, take some time to grieve, to do what you need to do to put, to put your things in order and come back a day or two later. Well, the doctor checked her and she was eight centimeters dilation. She could change at any moment and deliver that baby. So she had to stay. So she was taken to the high risk unit, not the labor and delivery unit because we didn't want her to hear other moms delivering and have her babies cry. So we took her to the, to the high risk unit when we were there, again, 
she dilated till 10 and started pushing. I remember interpreting for her for two hours for her to push that baby. When the baby was born, it was 5.30 in the morning. It was December. And the nurses, it was a beautiful baby girl, about eight and a half pounds. And they got the baby and then took her away, cleaned the baby and dressed her in a beautiful red velvet dress. And then at this point, it's six in the morning and they are calling, the mom and dad are calling all the family so that they would come and see the baby, even though the baby was, was a stillborn baby. That means that was born dead because they were going to do the ceremony of the dead. This is a Catholic family. And so they couldn't baptize the baby because you baptize an alive person. So they were going to do the ceremony for the dead. Uh, so they were calling the Catholic priest and everybody. At that point it's seven in the morning. And I would basically clock out at 7.30 and I call my manager, manager and said, I cannot leave this woman. I know I've been here all night, but this is continuation of, of care. May I please stay and be with her through the, the cele celebration to, to the celebration of the dead or the ceremony for the dead, not the celebration, the ceremony. My manager said yes. So at that moment, uh, the other interpreter, when she came, she took care of all the other patients. Well, it's about 10 in the morning. I'm interpreting for the ceremony of the dead and the room is filled with people, relatives, and even the two siblings of the, of the baby, the baby girl. When at that moment, grandmother collapsed. Grandmother collapsed and then everybody rushes to her. They call a, 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 a doctor. A, and then the doctor, when she recovered consciousness, then they started asking her questions. So I started interpreting for grandma, right? And within a few minutes, she fainted again. At that point, they just called an ambulance. They were afraid that she was, that she was having a heart attack. And then she went. But this is an example where I had to find that balance between interpreting for the mom and the, and the ceremony for the baby. And then I had to step out and interpret for the grandmother. A very difficult situation. Uh, that I was in that day. What about modalities of interpretation, right? Uh, some of us may feel that we are in disadvantage because we don't work on site like we see this interpreter or what we know as face-to-face. -face. Uh, for example, some VRI, video remote interpreters, may feel they are limited to what they can see on the screen. And OPI interpreters have the additional challenge of not having visual cues. It is also important to remember that ASL, American Sign Language Interpreters, cannot use the OPI modality as they rely on visual communication. What I want you to know is that regardless of the modality of interpretation, the information I am going to share with you today is going to equip you, is going to prepare you to know how to handle interpreting encounters just like the one I shared with you. You're going to feel confident, right? And more unsurer of yourself instead of wondering at the end of, a, of the encounter, did I, did I do a good job? Was it enough what I did? Okay, the EPIC model. The e EPIC acronym stands for Education for Physicians on the End of Life Care. E this model provides physicians with guidelines when delivering bad news to the patients. And you may be wondering why should we want to learn about physicians and, and, and end of life scenarios? Because the better we understand the model, the protocol that they follow, and the reasoning behind it, the better prepared we're going to be in that interpreted encounter. Just like the more we know about anatomy, physiology, the better our interpretation is going to be. The EPIC model uh, has 
is comprised of the SPIKES protocol, which is a six-step strategy for delivering bad news. So let's look at these six steps that the provider will follow. The SPIKES protocol, setting up the interview, patient's perception, obtaining the patient's invitation, giving knowledge and information to the patient, emotion, emotions and responding to feelings, and lastly, strategy and summary. So is Spike's protocol. You know, how is that going to help us interpreters? Well, let me tell you, this is how it's going to help us, right? It will help us, we, we can anticipate techniques used by the physicians when delivering those bad news. It will aid you, it will prepare you to use common phrases in the non-English language when delivering those bad news. And we're going to learn best practices to interpret the delivery of bad news. On the following slide, we're going to start with the six steps of the SPIKE protocol, and we'll see the applicability for us as well eh, as interpreters. So step one, setting up the interview. The provider will work on logistics to make the encounter as comfortable as possible for the patient. The EPIC model supports and encourages, okay, providers to allow the interpreter to have a pre-session with both them and the patient. Nevertheless, sometimes by the time the interpreter is called, the provider is ready to start the session. It could be intimidating, I know, for the interpreter to request to the provider to allow a few seconds, right? To have a brief introduction, but we must ask anyway. Remember, even if the precession is, is not to its entirety, having a brief introduction will aid you and the patient to establish rapport. And that's very important. To the provider, just asking briefly, anything I should know about the session, could be critical then for the interpreter to prepare themselves emotionally and mentally, and even they make use in that session. So be honest with the provider. Again, continuation. Now, if the provider has time, you may inquire more specific information, such as the topic, okay? Ask what the encounter will be about. Linguistic concerns. Emphasize to the provider the importance of avoiding medical jargon, idioms, and euphemisms. How many people are going to be in the interpreted encounter? You may want to write the names down, and titles of individuals involved in, in, in the interpreting encounter. Besides the physician and the nurse, you may have a full a room that is full with either social workers, chaplains, a hospice personnel, etc. For VRI and OPI interpreters, this is even more important to know because in advance we can know how many people are going to be in the room, who they are, and the role that they play because we don't have the visual cues if you are OPI. And VRI, you cannot see how many people are present. A medical terminology, yes, be frank with the provider. Ask for, for any diagnosis, the name of the procedure, anything at all that will help you to be ready for the session. And I can tell you, working in a teaching hospital, I would see so many times the, the residents asking the attending physician about what to do next, and, and you know what? There was no embarrassment to do that. Why? Because they were learning. So they asked questions as well. A step two, patient's perception. In this step, the provider will try to gather through different type of questions, how much the patient and the family really understand the bad news. Uh, do they have realistic or unrealistic expectations? It is imperative that the interpreter adheres to the principle of accuracy, which states the interpreter strives to render the message accurately 
conveying the content and the spirit of the original message, taking into consideration the, the cultural context. It is critical that the interpreter replicates the register, style, and tone of the speaker. This is a standard too under the principle of accuracy. Because why is this important? This will aid the provider to get a true sense of how much specific detail is necessary to share with the patient and the family. We we need to interpret faithfully any signs of wishful thinking. And this will provide, again, insight to the doctor if the patient and the family is in denial about the bad news. I have another example to share with you. A, there was a patient that had been told previously, like three months before her due date or more, or maybe six months throughout her pregnancy, that once the baby was born, the baby was going to to die within minutes, hours, no more than two days. She knew this, she knew this. Well, I was not born, I mean, I was not there for her delivery, but the night that I went to, to work, um, the, late, the nurses reminded me that the patient that we had and everything else, and the baby in high risk, it was mom and, and, and the baby, and the baby had a monitor to monitor the heartbeat so that the nurses could know and the, and the doctor when the, the heartbeat would stop beating, right? When the baby would die, plainly as that. Well, I was there that night, the baby was alive. And at some point within those 12 hours that I was working, the nurse calls me and she says, Analia, you need to meet Dr. Such and such, uh, such and such in, in this room because the baby died. So I met the doctor outside the room. He told me again, this is what we're going to do, Analia. We're going to tell the mom that the baby has died. We went inside. Now I want to remind you, mom, dad were there, a few relatives as well, that this patient had been told three, six months in advance that this baby had no likelihood whatsoever, 100% this baby would die. So I'm interpreting and the doctor tells the, the patient very kindly uh, that the baby's uh, heartbeat had stopped. And the patient asked to the doctor, what do you mean? Okay, so the provider says, there is no heartbeat. The baby has no heart beat. Well, what do you mean? I don't understand. At that point, the provider had just to straightforward, bluntly say, the baby has died. And even after I interpreted that, she was still puzzled and confused. Okay? So you see how important it is to interpret faithful, faithfully any signs of wishful thinking. In brief, we, for we to fulfill our job, we need to aid the physician to accomplish their goal by staying faithful and replicating everything as it is. Perception is reality, which may not be true. Nevertheless, perception is the reality of that person. And we need to think about that. The following are some common questions uh, the provider might use to glean uh, the information from the patient. The list is not exhaustive. Uh, due to time constraints, uh, I just want you to know that I'm not going to be uh, going over these questions during the presentation, but you will receive a handout with all the questions when you receive your certificate of completion. So you will have these questions. Okay, he, here are more questions. Uh, the provider, something I want to tell you, the provider may ask different questions in order to obtain an actual answer. It may sound redundant, to us, right? But the provider has the purpose in asking the same question in different ways. 
So please keep that in mind. Step three, obtaining the patient's invitation. The provider needs to assess how much the patient and the family want to know about the, the bad news. Um, professional uh, physicians will ask the patient, is it okay if I ask you some questions? Now, the interpreter is cognizant of the following, that there are factors that could influence how much the patient really wants to know, right? Uh, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, personality. Some people just don't want to know. Healthcare system. And this is where precession, hopefully, you have gleaned some of this information as you were doing your formal introduction. Remain impartial. It is essential, ladies and gentlemen, that we remain impartial, okay? If there is a difference of opinions within the, the parties involved, you know, as interpreters, we do not judge the content of the message or the opinions, the beliefs, the practices of the patient or their family. Remember the principle in our code of ethics, the principle of impartiality. Interpreters strive to maintain impartiality and refrain from counseling, advising, or projecting personal biases or belief. Regardless of being VRI or OPI, our emotions could be revealed through our facial expressions and our tone of voice. So we must remain impartial. Again, here are a few questions the physician may ask. We're not going to stop on them. I want to read just a few here. Uh, some people really do not want to be told what is wrong, but want their families to know. What do you prefer? Do you want me to explain exactly what is wrong? To whom should I talk to about these issues? So as you see, the provider will ask different questions, right? in order to understand what the patient wants to know. Grief is experienced in relation to the significance of the attachment. Unwittingly, we might pass judgment regarding how people react to their circumstances to the bad news that they just received. We need to consider that people are in part a product, product of their experiences, their backgrounds, and also circumstances at the time. Before I share my next, uh, the next scenario, I want to preface with this. Working at a labor and delivery hospital had many, many moments of joy and excitement. I would say most of those moments were joyful. Occasionally though, there were moments of despair, disappointment, and pain. On a few occasions when someone had a miscarriage, the family and friends with all the good intentions in the world, and you may have said things like this yourself to a friend or a relative, if they had a miscarriage, they would say, don't be sad. You can get pregnant again. Or you have other children. Don't be selfish. They need you. Snap out of your, your sadness. Or, hey, you can adopt a child. In moments like those, I can tell you this as a bereavement counselor, I remember this quote, and I will read it again. Grief is experienced in relation to the significance of the attachment and that attachment for that woman was the baby that she had lost and the father. So generally speaking, we could grieve anything that we are attached to us. If you are like me and you are a pet lover, when my dog Simon Lang passed away, and we had him cremated, my dog. Yes, I had him cremated. 
I went to pick up his ashes in an urn. And when I went to the bed, as I was walking in, I, uh, I said, I am here to pick up my son's ashes. And after I said that, it dawned on me, he was my son. You may be attached to possessions like a piece of jewelry, clothing, shoes, anything that was significant to you, a job. You lost your dream job and now nothing else will ever come back that you would be excited about. Or you lost a loved one. So grief is experience in relation to the significance of the attachment. Let's remember that. Step four, giving knowledge and information to the patient. The physician, when delivering bad news, the physician will be truthful but compassionate at the same time, pausing as needed. They will use body language and silence to facilitate the communication. Please keep in mind that to the patient, the phrases the provider will use to communicate the seriousness of the situation may be the most difficult, heart-wrenching words they have ever heard in their lives. Therefore, as an interpreter, following the next tips are very, very important. Wait a few extra seconds before jumping into interpreting. That time of silence may be necessary to convey the intended message. Yes, I know it is uncomfortable, but it is essential. Accuracy, replicate the speaker's register, style, and tone. Request clarification when needed. If something is not clear to you, such as, as a word, a sentence, okay, anything at all, it is critical that you request clarification. So you convey exactly what the provider is intending. You don't want to convey the wrong message. Uh, this could be detrimental. Keep in mind, the phrase, I am sorry, might be misconstrued by the patient or family to mean the physician is responsible, a sign of pity. So please, Choose a word that conveys empathy. And again, I know what you're thinking. You might be thinking, well, Analia, how I am going to accomplish that? Well, remember that each person watching this presentation will have access to the entire list of questions a provider may ask when delivering bad news. Therefore, be sure to do the following, okay? Translate into the non-English language all the questions provided from this presentation and consult any sources like books, uh, talk to native speakers, other colleagues, any source that will help you to develop a clear yet compassionate vocabulary. Okay, so we're going to skip on these phrases. Okay, I am just going to read this once quickly. Unfortunately, there is no question about the test results. It is cancer. The report of the amniocentesis is back and it's not what I had hoped for. It showed that the baby has Down syndrome. Remember, the phrases just mentioned may be some of the most difficult, challenging ones an individual might hear about their health or the health of a loved one. The more comfort comfortable we become using these phrases in our non-English language, the easier it will be to deliver the difficult news to the patient. Step five, emotions and responding to feelings. The physician will allow the patient to express their feelings. The response to bad news varies again from patient to patient and within the family. And the interpreter, okay? Give the patient and the family members time to process the information. Silence may be uncomfortable, but necessary. Cultural awareness. The principle of cultural awareness states interpreters strive to develop awareness of the, of the cultures encountering the performance of the interpreting duties. Knowledge about a particular culture and norm 
does not translate directly into knowledge about the particular person or family system. Remember, each individual, each patient, each family member is unique. Another uh, scenario, now that we're talking about cultural awareness. So um, this person delivered a baby that had Down syndrome. This mom and dad were from a very small tribe in the from the country of Guatemala. So that night when I came to interpret, uh, they, she had already delivered, the nurses called me to the NICU, NICU unit, a neonatal intensive care unit and said, hey, Analia, we're going to call mom and dad because we're very concerned. They have not come and see the baby in over a week. The baby had Down syndrome. So they called the nurse, the nurse brought mom and dad. And as they, the nurses ask, and I'm interpreting, obviously, I'm being transparent, meaning interpreting everything that is said by either party in the encounter. Uh, the nurses ask mom, why have, and dad, why haven't you come to see the baby? And they simply replied, because the baby is of the devil. Why do, do you mean that the baby is of the devil? Basically, long story short, because the baby had Down syndrome. And babies seen, a babies that had any condition in, in their tribe in Guatemala were considered of the devil. So they decided not to take the baby home. So again, cultural awareness is important for us as interpreters. Uh, this cultural awareness include us as well, not only the patient. We need to continue to explore our own implicit bias or unconscious bias, biases. Keep in mind to alert the provider and the patient to discuss any cultural information that is relevant to the encounter, anything at all that will aid the patient and the doctor to understand, right? A, what, how they are not uh, communicating well. Also adhere to the principle of impartiality, as I mentioned earlier, abstain from passing judgment on the patient's uh, or the family's reaction. Uh, this may interfere with your interpreting and will not add value to the communication. Understanding individual differences is part of cultural competence. Remember, there are personal approaches to grieving. Some people, when they grieve, they are angry at, at first or sad or frustrated or in disbelief. Other people, I, I hear that they laugh. They are in shock. They can't believe what they heard. There are generational ways of grieving. Research shows millennials share their grief through digital connection, like social media, instead of not all of them, but some of them. Family differences, okay? People may come from the same family nucleus, but we may grieve differently because we are unique individuals. To some extent, remember, we evolve and we're a product of our own experiences, at least at the time. Timetables are different for everybody. People grieve at different times. Some right away, some later on. It may take days, months, even years for somebody to grieve completely. Father and mother's grief might be incompatible. Why? And I experienced this working as a bereavement counselor because mothers, they tend, they tend, not everybody, everybody is different, tend to grieve first because the father tries to be strong for her. And again, there are many comments uh, doctors might make. Uh, we're going to not focus on this, but it is crucial that we know the right translation of these phrases, right? In order to convey the intended meaning, as I have mentioned before. Okay, we are going to pass by this. Okay, here's another quote from my bereavement uh, counseling training. Death is a universal experience, yet responses to it are shaped by cultural attitudes and beliefs. Therefore, death is a cultural event. This quote comes from the book title, The Last Dance, 
encountering death and dying. Strategy and summary, the physician's final step is to reassure the patient and family of the continuation of care if appropriate. For the interpreter, it's very, oops, what happened here? For the interpreter, let's convey the message accurately and remember to research the equivalent phrases in the non-English language. And again, we're going to not cover those questions. Also, there are possible responses to patients' questions, but you have all of this, right? Uh, in the document that you're going to get. Okay. A strategy and summary, okay? Don't soften the bluntness of the message. How you deliver the message is just as important as what you say. Be careful not to distance yourself from the emotions by interpreting literally. So study out the type of statements doctors use to express compassion and empathy. Okay, wow, what a journey, right? The interpreted session is over. It has been a challenging one, a challenging interpreting encounter. Therefore, it is essential that we take time to take care of ourselves. We are human beings with emotions and feelings. If you need to, take time for yourself. Take time to debrief and do self-care. Debrief, just share with someone how the encounter you just interpreted for affected you. It is important you take time to process your feelings and emotions. And ladies and gentlemen, this is part also of the interpretation process of self-reflection. And we can do that and at the same time respect the principle of confidentiality by not sharing PHI protected health information. And self-care, this may seem obvious, but we think we're superhumans, that we should be tough. Nevertheless, if we don't take care of ourselves physically, mentally, and emotionally, we, we may end up ourselves and become burnt out. Therefore, take time, please take time to take care of yourself and whatever you need to do that brings you peace, joy, and relaxation. Okay, here I go, take courage. Yes, take courage because now you have all the resources you need to feel and to be confident in your ability to interpret bad news. As the interpreter, ladies and gentlemen, we contribute to making the experience of delivering bad news a little less difficult to the patients we serve. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do. Uh, thank you for being here today with such a challenging topic. And I am going to start presenting right now. This is the end so that we have some time for questions. Thank you, everybody. Wow, well, thank you, Analia. Uh, I think I feel like we just got started about five minutes ago and we're already <laughs> uh, 55 minutes into the presentation. There was, it was remarkable for a long time during the presentation, there was no activity. Um, I think everyone was really sort of riveted um, by everything you were saying. So thank you so much for putting your heart and your soul. It was really truly what you were putting in there uh, and you gave us a piece of that. So that's, that's, that's something everyone certainly appreciates and just um, and is grateful for. So can't thank you enough. Um, I just want to say right now, um, well, a quick comment from, from Andrew Stanek. This presentation has the best quotes of any webinar I've attended, so thoughtful and genuine. Thank you. From Dana Hillkirk, this is the most beautiful and interesting presentation and topic to consider for being an interpreter. Thank you, Analia. There's so many really good quotes um, that you mentioned, perception is reality. 
as interpreters, we do not judge the content of the message. He mentioned, he was my son. He said as well, wait a few seconds before jumping into the interpretation. Choose a word that conveys empathy. Mothers tend to grieve first because fathers try to be strong for them. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. We have limited time. Uh, I had actually messaged on Aliyah during the presentation, take your time. It's obviously, it's very, very important content. Um, feel free to email us with your questions as well. We can certainly reach out to Analia. Analia in the presentation has her contact information as well. You're welcome to reach out to Analia. Um, we're gonna do our best. I know Analia has, has some con time constraints and I definitely wanna mention that at the 12.30 Eastern time mark, um, you, don't, you no longer have to stay in the webinar. Um, you'll get your CEU certificate. Please check your junk mail. If, if it has not arrived within 24 hours, it'll come from Zoom. Um, but okay, so Laura Rodriguez uh, here with a question. I work at a migrant shelter and while processing migrants have had to tell minors and very young children that their father is not their biological parent. Therefore, they can't remain together at the shelter. Any suggestions on how to interpret this without adding to the pain the minor is about to encounter. Right. And um, I mean, any any situation like that where the child is going to learn from the, for the very first time that they are, the parent is not their biological a parent and they cannot stay together is it, heart-wrenching. Even if, if you were told as a child that you were adopted, it's heart-wrenching. I will just go back to what what I shared during this presentation, the best way for us to convey everything is to adhere to the accuracy, to replicate the tone, the style of the speaker. And that said, sometimes we may see that the person that is saying this communication to the child is completely, is rude, it lacks empathy. They don't care, they are tired. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. still need to adhere to interpreting as it is. All that I can say to you and to all of us is, at the end of the day, if we do our job and we adhere to, to our code of ethics, we adhere to everything that we have said, whatever brings you peace in your heart, do that. For me was, I would pray for my patients because I believe in the power of prayer. Maybe to you, it's a ceremony. Maybe to you, it's just great energy, whatever it is, then do that because you feel like you have done, you adhere to, to, to your protocol, to, to your code of ethics, but the rest you and I have no control over. But if you do what you can, then at least somehow, some way, I can tell you that I found peace in spite of all these very difficult scenarios that I shared with all of you. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, Julieta Jasso, um, it is very difficult to deliver bad news, especially when the provider beats around the bush, isn't clear, avoids at all costs the word death. I've had to take out the provider to tell her to use the word death dying because the parents are not understanding what he is trying to insinuate. So that was a comment from Julieta. Um, from Patricia, patient versus family. Wouldn't Ethic, uh, wouldn't the code of ethics give precedence to patient if there is some disconnect or antipathy between them, or if patient doesn't give okay to have family receive the information? Absolutely. So the question, wouldn't the code of ethics give precedence, what I believe you're, you're asking, Patricia, wouldn't the code of ethics give precedence to the patient if there is some disconnect or disharmony, antipathy between patient and family, or if patient doesn't give okay to have family receive the information. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the hospital has protocols, the clinics have yes. protocols for whom information can be shared with. Yes. 
Um, Laura Bandiver, I've had to interpret for the exact same situation, referring to a situation you mentioned, Analia. Mm -hmm. It is extremely heartbreaking. As interpreters, our role is key in these situations as in any other. So true. Um, Okay, from Marisol Jimenez. A lot of these are comments. Everything you presented was very, very clear. Uh, Marisol Jimenez mentioned how to ignore your feelings. Question. Some people maybe can. It's something very hard for me personally. That story is heartbreaking, but probably she was very grateful you were there. This hey. job has an impact in many ways. Can I make, make a comment? Absolutely, absolutely. As far as what was just mentioned, I always kept reminding myself as I interpreted for these difficult encounters that somebody had to do it. You know, somebody had to do it. And I was grateful that I was the one to do it because I felt that I adhere to my code of ethics. I adhere to my protocols. And that I would rather a trained interpreter do that, that somebody that is just not going to even care about the profession or the person. So my encourage to each one of you, my interpreters today, when you feel like, how can I do this? Because you're here, that shows that you care about the profession, that you care about people, that you care about growing and, and becoming and getting all the knowledge that you need, that if somebody has to deliver that news, that news, thank goodness it is you. And I felt what a privilege, what a privilege to be with that family, with that mother, that dad, at the most difficult times maybe in their lives. I feel honored. And that's why to this day it's like, I miss my interpreting in labor and delivery because even the, those difficult times, I felt blessed to be part of that person's life. Wow, very true. So true. Uh, Rebecca Antonucci, it helps me to put all my energy into the interpretation itself and remind myself that I can deal with it at a later time. I assume maybe the trauma is what you meant. It's not easy, but it does help me. So in terms of it's difficult, but if you just focus on maintaining register, on precisely rendering the message, on staying within your role. But still, definitely, as interpreters, we do have vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. We do put ourselves in the position of the patient. We do experience something, and it does have to be dealt with. It's very easy to burn yourself out as an interpreter when you're constantly being thrown into situations that you have no control over and, and that you're affected by. So absolutely. Um, from Andre Parlade, um, very nice comment. Thank you for sharing your experience. This makes us more capable and stronger in the field. Very nice. Um, okay. So from uh, Farah Shaikh, I am a remote interpreter and we don't get the pre-session, we get live calls. That's the only downfall. So Analia, can you talk a little about, I know you touched on it, yes. but some of the nuances, and we get to a lot of this yes. in the remote interpreter textbook, but the nuances of, well, just not being physically present. What does that mean for the interpreter role? Yes, I'm, and I'm sorry, what's it, do you repeat all, I mean, could you repeat the name of gen, gentleman? Sure, the sure, it's Farah Sheikh. Farah. Okay, Farah and everybody else. So let me tell you this. I am a, I am a VRI and an OPI interpreter as well. And just like the providers, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists, and everybody else, they have a code of ethics and protocols to follow. We do too. Yep. So you fight for that precession. Okay. Obviously, if you can say everything that, that you would like to say, wonderful. But if only you have 10 seconds, you can say everything is going to be interpreted and everything is confidential. That would be to the patient. Because let me just tell you something. Some of the patients that we interpret for are here illegally. And for them to know 
that everything is confidential, you're opening the doors for them to say anything they need to say. One time I interpreted for this woman, the doctor's like, you've been, you're nine months pregnant and this is, you've never had prenatal care. And she basically said, I just crossed, you know, the river basically from Mexico. And then the provider was able to say, okay, then we need to do this, right? And with the provider just to say, obviously your name, you're going to, inter- and that everything is going to be interpreted. They don't need to know everything mm-hmm. is confidential because they already know that, right? But that is, is a safeguard for you because you're going to interpret everything. And if the provider later gets mad at you, why did you interpret that? Oh, Dr. Smith, I told you that everything will always be interpreted. So do you see, you can even have a five second, 10 second pre-session it will establish rapport with you and the provider and you and the patient and you fight for yourself. I've been taking OPI calls recently. And let me tell you before they couldn't see me but I always raised my hand because that's what I did when I used to work in person. And I would say, excuse me, Dr. Smith, I just need to introduce myself briefly to the patient. It will take a few seconds. Of course, Analia. So yes, I understand. Yes, DRI, OPI, you fight to have your precession. If it has to be 10 seconds, 10 seconds is and is going to help you. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Okay. So you've, yeah, always try and assert yourself as the interpreter in the pre-session to ensure the most critical information is at least communicated so the patient feels comfortable being the patient and not holding back because we don't know what they may need to communicate. Um, and then from Biljana Nezevic, delivering bad news is different in many cultures. So that is also a problem. And I wish we had Biljana here to, to kind of elaborate on that, but there's definitely, uh, it was, it was a comment she put in the, in the comment section relative to the word when you were talking about how frequently a provider will say, I am sorry when they're delivering bad news and it almost gives the impression that it's the provider's fault. Uh, And how I think Beljana's point is that there's so many nuances to cultural assimilation of, 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 of trauma that at the same time, um, we're not cultural experts. Everyone has, has a different cultural yeah, we're we're only experts our own our own particular culture. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and feel free to peruse Analia the chat oh, as okay. well. I'm just going through, <laughs> and I just want to mention to everyone that um, if you see any any interesting questions, Analia, feel free to address them. I'm just mentioning to everyone that um, right now we're just trying to get to some Q and A. I know Analia has a hard stop soon but we're trying to get to some of the questions. Fantastic presentation. So we went a little bit over, but absolutely worth it. Um, And so you don't need to hang on. You're free to to get off the webinar. You will get your certificate uh, within the next 24 hours. Uh, It will come from Zoom. Um, Feel free to uh, obviously also check, check your junk mail if it doesn't arrive, but reach out to us as well if for some reason you don't get it. Uh, One question that I just read, it says, do you have any advice for what to do when overcome with emotion while interpreting for a patient? And I'm glad that I saw that question because sometimes we go into the encounter, we know what we're going to interpret about, and guess what? We think we can handle it, and then we get to a point that we become overcome with those emotions, right? you may just say, interpreter speaking, uh, Dr. Smith, I just need to pause, uh, if you're VRI, right? I just need to pause for a moment. Uh, thank you for waiting. Interpreter speaking, Mrs. Gonzalez, I am going to pause for a moment. Uh, I'll be right back. So that would be if you're OPI and VRI. And just take a moment to breathe and breathe and... out, right? Exactly. And compose yourself. Uh, 
obviously, if you can get somebody else to take over the interpreting encounter, you yep. can ask your supervisor to do that. That's another option. If you are in person, like the situation with the mother that had a stillborn, meaning the baby mm -hmm. was born dead, and mm -hmm. I stayed five hours over my 12 hour shift, okay? I, and I have kids that that baby that had beautiful cheeks and was eight and a half weeks pregnant reminded me of one of my one of my daughters. Many times I when they were born, I felt overcome with emotion. But I kept telling myself, Analia, if you crack right now, you cannot help this woman. And I am kidding you not. I still see it so vividly. At 11.05, when I swipe, swiped my car that I was clocking out, right there in the hallway in the hospital, I broke down in tears. It's like I felt that for the first time I was able to breathe since 1 a.m. So again, I was able to hold it, you know, till then. If you can, great. But if you can't, you can always, I know for me working at the hospital, if I needed to ask for my Switch money out. or somebody else, I could always request that. So yes, just, just see what you can handle. and But also don't, don't be too hard on yourself. Absolutely. Don't be too hard on yourself. Um, uh, from Julio Jimenez, how can an interpreter deal with a situation where the doctors make no sense because they're using so many euphemisms? Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Again, this is one of the times when we have to intervene. And I usually would Communicate with the, the patient first. Interpreter speaking, Mrs. Gonzalez, I need to ask the doctor uh, to please speak in simpler terms. And then interpreter speaking, Dr. Smith, could you please uh, restrain from using euphemisms or idioms and just uh, speak in simpler terms? And then I would just ask the provider to do that. Now, you always have to be transparent. If they say, well, why do you want me to do that? Then you need to let the patient know that you are you know, you always remember, you have to be transparent. It is a disservice if we're not transparent because the patient feels that we're leaving them out of the same yeah. appointment that they are in, right? But yes, you can request always to the provider to simplify the term. Excellent, excellent. Uh, thank you, Natasha Lang, for your comment. That's a really great point about how we can grieve anything that we are attached to. We're not here to judge the content of the message. We have to be aware of that. Um, thank you, Andrew. Extremely poignant point about grief, referring to a portion of your presentation, especially in light of the massive disruption that the COVID pandemic has caused worldwide. Uh, from Edna, many providers or healthcare staff give you the give you the look when you request for clarification to them, and, and that's that's fair. Um, but it's also fair of you to ask for it. We can't expect to interpret in a perfect world. It just is what it is. But you're doing the right thing by asking for clarification. Absolutely. And can I tell you something since we have time? Of course. To hang it out? <laughs> okay, working at a teaching hospital taught me many things, but one of the ones that I want to share right now is that they start not knowing much. A first year resident, after I had been there for a couple of years, I knew what kind of questions he needed to ask. <laughs> I knew what he needed to tell the patient. And I vividly remember this time. It was funny, right? It was the second, per, uh, second or third pregnancy. Okay, and the, she was like about four centimeters di dilation. And the first year resident, you know, it was her second, third pregnancy, but the third year resident was about to send her home and basically told the patient, and I'm interpreting, you know, let's say Mrs. Gonzalez, eh, I think you probably can go home, we'll be right back. And I interpret that. When he went to talk to the attending physician, you know what the attending physician said? You know, this is either her second or third pregnancy. Do you know that Spanish speaking, that's what they would say, Spanish speaking women, Latin women, they deliver very fast. No, don't send her home. 
here's what I would like you to tell her. <laughs> tell her to walk for two hours and come back to triage and we'll recheck her and then we'll proceed. Do you think that this resident came to the room and said, Mrs. Gonzalez, I made a mistake. My attending physician just told me that you should really walk for two hours and then we re-examine you and then maybe we'll change. No, he came back and he said, you know what? I think we're going to do this, right? And of course he shouldn't tell her that he's just learning and making mistakes. People, my dad was a gynecologist and an obstetrician. I have the utmost respect for doctors and anybody that works in the healthcare facility. That said, they are humans like us and they make mistakes. And just like they need to go back and retract what they said and change it, if you need to intervene, if you need clarification, if you need to act as a cultural broker, you're doing your job just as they are doing their job. And do we make faces at them? No. I always say, you are not just the interpreter, you are the interpreter. The, uh, interpreter. I love that, the I love that. And the doctor <laughs> so and the nurse and the respiratory therapist, nobody can have their goal met if you don't do your job right. And they don't know what our job is. And that's why they make faces. If they knew that we need to intervene to request clarification because we don't want them to give a misdiagnosis, yeah. They would be applauding us. Yes, thank you for yeah. intervening, Analia. Thank you. Yeah. They don't know what they don't know. Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Well said. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, just looking through uh, for all the questions. And I just want to remind everyone that we're done with the webinar and we're just hanging out trying to get to, to as many questions as possible. Uh, you will get your. Uh, your certificate for your CEUs within the next 24 hours, please check your junk or spam. Um, yeah, Sonia Perez said it very well. I love all your personal experiences and stories, Analia. <laughs> Thank you for sharing them. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, you know, this one comes up pretty frequently, Analia, um, in, in, in a lot of cultures. I often get pulled aside by family members of the patient who want me not to use the C word within mm -hmm. parentheses cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, I share that with the provider, but it strikes me as odd nowadays. But it is frequent within certain cultures. Right. Um I, I will tell you this, remember that our first responsibility is to the patient and to the provider, yep. right? And so when we face challenging situations, we can alert to the provider of, of what the family members are doing. Uh, I had occasions where I was going to, from one unit to another unit at the hospital and the family and the relatives were waiting in the, in the waiting room to see if the patient had delivered. And, one time the patient did, and they were asking me, did she have the baby? Well, guess what? I need the provider to be present for me to say anything. So I will always remind them any information, we must have the provider present or the patient. Thank you for waiting. We'll get back to you. Now, this, this thing with the C for cancer, right? That they, they would like for you not to use that word. Again, you can let them know. I can... I can, oh my gosh, this is the beautiful saying, mm -hmm. okay, for that I Just say no, yep, guys. yep. <laughs> oh, oh um, let's say that, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, I can see you're very concerned about using the word C, and I can see why you feel that way. Uh, what about if you talk to the provider about this, and also the patient, uh, per my code of ethics, anything that is said in the encounter, must be interpreted. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, if yeah. they don't want you to use the word C, they need to talk to the provider, not to you, because if the provider uses the word C, you need to use the word C for cancer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. One last reminder we're going to take probably, I know Analia has a hard stop, so we're going to take just a few more questions. Um, Aurora. 
Of all the presentations, Analia, you have helped to remind me how important we are as part of the healthcare team. Thank you very much. We're not just the interpreter, we are the interpreter. That's the best quote. Um, this is very powerful from Brahim. Thank you. Um, okay, Melissa Salazar. How do you feel about the interpreter holding patient's hand? Sometimes patients ask for my hand or go to hug me. I don't decline, but I'm not sure how it's viewed. Melissa, I'm so glad you asked the question because I do have an answer, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so I, I think a few things. Um, first of all, make sure that you are very transparent with if you work for an institution, a hospital, like in this case, when I used to work at the hospital, our manager was okay with us. If the patient needed to have their hands held, our uh, manager was okay with that. So first of all, if you work for somebody else, learn what you are allowed to do and what you are not allowed to do. Uh, so for 12 and a half years, I did held hands. You know, when pe people were pushing, they were holding my hands, you know? Uh, so that's absolutely right. If you feel uncomfortable, obviously, then don't do it. But obviously, talk to somebody if you, that you work for just to ensure that whatever you do is, is okay with them. Absolutely, no, great point. Talk to, if you're in a healthcare institution, there's a interpreting services department, talk to your manager, talk to the quality person, because it is something that comes up very frequently. Excellent. Um, thank you, Analia. Um, okay, I, I believe this will be the last question uh, from Sura. In Arabic culture, conveying bad news to a patient is considered cruel by the family on the part of the interpreter to do it. The family will blame the interpreter, not the provider, for being inconsiderate of their patient's feelings. Many times they become aggressive towards the interpreter. Wow, this is very difficult. And uh, I, I've never experienced this in my culture. You do share your feelings, so I cannot say that I can relate to your question. Uh, what I can say is that Sometimes we have to be the bad cop and do the job, okay? And if at any point doing your job is interfering with the communication, then you can be a cultural broker, right? And alert the provider. Again, I always say Dr. Smith and Mrs. Gonzalez, uh, if you need to do it before uh, you continue interpreting, I want you to know, I, I would like to communicate to the patient, uh, I mean, to the relative that I'm abide, I must adhere to my code of ethics and anything that you say will need to be interpreted. And then I'm going to let them know that that's what I'm going to do and that all the communication is coming from you. So maybe yep. you need to do an extra clarification. Debrief. Exactly, you will debrief and then you interpret that the to the family, exactly. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. Well, no, I just want to thank you again, Analia, for, for really sharing your heart and your soul and, and your love for the interpreting profession. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this will be the last webinar of 2022, but we look forward to starting early next year. Uh, again, you'll get an email soon uh, with your certificate. If you have any questions, we will have uh, the presentation, a link to the presentation. It does have Analia's contact information. It has our contact information. We can certainly track down Analia if you have any questions for her. Uh, but again, thank, thank you all. I hope you have um, a yeah, wonderful rest of the year. And we look forward to, to, to getting this started again next year. Thanks so much, Analia. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful thank day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.